Fur is the world's oldest item of clothing. Since the dawn of time, fur has protected man against the elements, and it's always been sought after as an article of natural beauty. Fur is still an attractive commodity, but fashion today is a greater driving force than our desire to protect ourselves against the cold. The first silver foxes were imported from Norway to Denmark in 1928, and a few years later, the first North American mink arrived. The number of mink farms rose steadily until the end of the 1980s, when Denmark had no fewer than 5,000 mink farms. Today, there are about 1,500 fur farms in Denmark, but these farms are on average much larger and fur is now one of Denmark's major exports. Dansk Pelsdyrauleforening, or the Danish Fur Breeders Association, was set up in 1930. In 1946, the association bought Kopenhavns Pelsenshal, the Copenhagen Fur Center, which was later renamed Danske Pelsauktioner, the Danish Fur Auctions, where members sold their furs. In 1963, the auction house moved to Klostrup, where it currently employs approximately 400 people. Copenhagen Fur is a cooperative and is now the name of both the association and the auction house. 90% of the furs sold at Copenhagen Fur are mink. The annual auction turnover is approximately 5 billion Danish kroner. Nearly all the furs are sold for export and constitute an important contribution to Denmark's balance of payments. The fur business in Denmark creates 25,000 direct and indirect jobs. When spring comes and the days become longer and lighter, the mink start to come into season. It's the changing light conditions that trigger the mink's mating cycles, and by March, when light starts to win out over darkness, the mink farmers get ready for one of their busiest periods. Mating takes place by the mink farmer taking a female and placing it in a cage with a male, whereupon mating commences. It may take half an hour before the mating's over, before the mating season starts, the mink farmer will have decided which males and females are to mate based on certain breeding criteria. Working days are therefore spent moving animals from cage to cage and monitoring that mating actually takes place. Each female is mated twice with an interval of nine days. It's particular to mink that it is the mating that triggers ovulation and after nine days a new set of eggs is ready to be fertilized. Only when the mating is over do the fertilized eggs attach themselves to the womb of the female and the development of the embryos commences. From this point, it takes 30 days for the embryos to develop. During the entire mating season, the mink farmer keeps an exact account of which animal is being mated with which animal. This is done as part of the breeding program, which means that the mink farmer must know what the mink's family tree looks like. In late spring, the mink farm experiences another busy, but also very exciting period. The end of April and beginning of May is the time when the kits start to be born. This is a vital period in which the mink farmer spends a great deal of time ensuring that the kits get a good start in life. The kits are born blind and furless. They're very vulnerable and completely dependent on their mother awaited to know how well the female looks after her young and how many mink each female produces. This information is recorded on a handheld terminal and is used as part of the selection of breeding stock where a high average of kits and good mothering skills are weighted highly. On average, each female produces slightly more than five kits, but more than double that number is possible. If the female produces a larger number of kits, the young mink are moved around in order to relieve the female, as she'd otherwise face a difficult task in looking after her brood. It takes eight weeks from the mink being completely hairless until they're ready to be weaned. When the day is over and the mink farmer has inspected and cared for the animals on the farm, the observations and records of the day are uploaded to a computer. The mink farmer uses these records to plan and organize the farm's breeding program. On about the 1st of July, a major moving operation starts at the mink farms. 
At this time, the young mink are eight weeks old, and it's time to wean them from the female, who needs some peace and quiet after having produced her litter. The kits have now learnt to eat and drink independently, and are on the whole able to fend for themselves. The pups are normally placed in pairs so that there's a male and a female together. That ensures that the mink develop normal behaviour. When they're to be weaned, the pups are caught in traps so that they can be handled by the mink farmer. He checks their gender because if two males or two females are put together, they begin fighting. Until the animals are selected for breeding and their fur, caring for the animals consists of providing nesting material and feeding them to ensure that they grow well and stay healthy. Darwin's theory of natural selection is set aside on the mink farms. Here the mink farmer reigns supreme and decides which animals are best suited to hand down their genes to the next generation. Each year before harvesting starts, the mink farmers review their mink to determine which animals to keep as breeding stock. The farm is full of hair and wool as the mink have just shed their summer fur for their winter coats. Lidt længere i hårene, så er det jo en træer eller en toer, ikke? Men det er jo bedst, hvis man kan nøjes med afstyr i femeren og firen, ja. Her har vi en god fast ud, ikke? Med lidt, lidt dårlig overflade. Altså, en god fast ud, det er, når den fylder fælderne. Rillerne her, ikke? Så når vi kan køre rundt i den, og hårene kommer lige tilbage, ikke? Det er en udfordring hver dag, synes jeg. Fordi to mink er ikke ens. Man kan blive ved med at... Og, og det skifter også lidt med typer og... Og jeg synes, det er en udfordring. Hver eneste dag. Ellers har vi heller ikke været så længe. <laughs> Denmark has 14 feed kitchens for fur-bearing animals supplying mink feed to Danish fur farmers. One of them is Sydvestjysk Fodercentral in Esbjerg. Feed production takes place at night, so that the fresh feed can be delivered to farmers early in the morning. Minkhoder består af 40% fiskerelaterede produkter, og så cirka 25% af slagteraffald. Det er hovedsageligt fra slagtekyllingproduktionen og også produkter fra svineslagninger. Herudover er det cirka 20% af vegetabilske ting, og så er der noget vand. The 14 Danish feed kitchens together own Dansk Pelsdyrfoder, the Danish fur-bearing animal feed, which purchases feed ingredients, checks feed quality, and continuously researches the optimum feed composition for fur-bearing animals. Tidligere, der fik vi jo de fleste fiskeråvarer fra, fra Danmark, men fiskeriet har jo ændret sig betydeligt i Danmark, så i dag der er de største leverandører af fiskeprodukter, det er Island og Færøerne. Slagteraffald, jamen der får vi det hele fra Danmark. Korn og andre ting kommer fra Danmark og Nordtyskland. Andre ting, proteinkilder, majsluten og lignende, kommer fra Frankrig og Belgien. Alle let fordærvelige råvarer, de er opbevares på frost. Og det er jo fordi, at vi har jo en lagerbygning i vinterhalvåret. Det største forbrug af råvarer ligger jo i vækstperioden, som er fra ca. 15. 6. til 15. november. Production is monitored throughout the process and random sampling is carried out to ensure that the feed has the right composition of proteins, fats and solids. In addition to achieving the right balance between fish, 
meat and cereals, it's important that the feed has the correct consistency so that it can hang on the mesh of the mink cages. Frisk foder, jamen det er ret så afgørende, fordi at minken er jo et, et rovdyr. Og minken vil jo i naturen dræbe og spise med det samme. Derfor er det vigtigt, at det er en, om jeg så må sige, en lækker servering, som minken bliver præsenteret for. Det jeg synes, det er spændende i, i hverdagen at være en del af, det er, at vi fremskaffer nogle biprodukter, affaldsprodukter, eksempelvis fra fiskeindustrien. Og når man så ser, at i løbet af et år, der bliver det til en rigtig lækker pels. Det synes jeg, det er et spændende at være en del af den proces. At the beginning of November, the harvesting season starts on the mink farms. This is when the mink fur matures and the breeding animals are selected for the following year. The animals that are not needed for breeding are first killed and then skinned. Killing takes place very quickly and painlessly. The mink farmer takes the mink to be killed directly from the cage and puts them in the gassing box. It only takes a few seconds from the time the mink is taken out of the cage until it's unconscious. The gassing box contains carbon monoxide or CO2, which are very effective gases for killing mink. The methods permitted for the killing of domestic animals are set out in Danish law, which emphasizes a quick and humane death. The pelts are then rolled in sawdust to remove dirt from their fur. Previously, all mink farmers skinned their animals at home on the farm, but now many farmers have joined forces to set up harvesting facilities together. In North Jutland, mink farmers have together set up Lemvi and Ilse Pelserie, which every year harvests 440,000 mink. Most mink are skinned in November and December, while others are stored in freezers for skinning later in the season. Mink farmers have reared the mink carefully throughout the year to ensure that they've achieved the best fur possible. It's therefore important that skinning takes place without damaging the fur. To ensure a uniform and systematized process, skinning is carried out by specially trained staff using state-of-the-art technology. Before skinning, the mink are rolled in a drum with sawdust for approximately 20 minutes to remove the natural fats from the fur. During skinning, a straight, unbroken cut is made from pad to pad in the natural boundary between back and belly. The fur is then pulled free of the carcass and neck and forward to the ears. Ears and eyes and then the jaw and nose are freed by careful cutting. The mink carcass is sent for biological processing at Dhaka, where it's used to produce biodiesel. When the pelts have been harvested, the fat needs to be scraped off. Fur that's not scraped immediately is packed in plastic and stored in freezers until it's ready for onward processing. During scraping, the pelt is placed on a fleshing beam, which scrapes the fur completely free of fat without damaging the leather. The fat is collected and sent for bioprocessing together with the mink carcass. The scraped pelt is then placed first in a mesh drum leather side out. Then the pelts are turned fur side out and placed in the drum in sawdust again for approximately 40 minutes. Afterwards, the pelt is pulled onto a drying board and dried before it's ready for delivery to Copenhagen fur.
The drying boards are wrapped in grease absorbent paper and drying board bags and the pelts are smoothed with the front legs placed in the pelt. To streamline production and save on labour and work processes, the Danish fur industry has invested heavily in the development of new technology and machinery. A systematic production ensures a uniform product where the risk of human error has been reduced. When the pelts have been pulled onto drying boards, they're dried. The drying boards with the furs are put on carts and air is blown through the fur. Before the mink farmers send their pelts to the harvesting facility, they're marked with a coloured chip. The chip follows the pelt throughout the skinning process and mink farmers all have their own dedicated colour to ensure that they're able to recognise their pelts. When the pelt is dry, it's taken off the drying board and the farmers are then able to mark their pelts with barcodes and send them to the Copenhagen Fur Auction House in Glostrup. When the pelt is sold at one of the season's five auctions, the barcode ensures that the individual farmer will receive the exact amount of money the skin was sold for. 250, Copenhagen Fur is the world's largest auction house for pelts and a global centre for the fur industry. Five times a year, buyers from all over the world meet at the fur auctions at Copenhagen Fur, and when the hammer hits the podium, the world market price for mink pelts is determined. At Copenhagen Fur's auctions, up to five million mink pelts are offered for sale, and these are sold at a total price of far more than one billion Danish kroner over just five auction days. The season's five auctions stretch from December, when the pelts have just been skinned, to September, when the last furs are sold. Before each auction, there are five to six days of inspection, when buyers inspect and assess the furs. Prior to customer inspection, the fur has been sorted by type, size, colour, clarity, fur length and quality. A large part of the sorting is carried out in automated facilities using state-of-the-art computer technology. Pelts of the same type, size, colour and quality are collected in batches and each batch is given a lot number which act as buyer's references when bidding at the auctions. As it's not practical for buyers to inspect all the pelts, show lots are put together containing approximately 30 pelts, which represent a large number of furs of precisely the same type. Customers come from all over the world, and when Copenhagen Fur auctions its pelts, the auction house is transformed into an international microcosm. Chinese, Greek, Russian, English, German, Italian, Korean, Japanese and a wide number of other languages are spoken. Auctions run from early morning to late at night and many customers choose to take a break during proceedings while pelts of a type for which they don't have orders are being auctioned. Fur buyers are tradespeople who are constantly on the move. When the auctions are over at Copenhagen Fur, they travel on to the next fur auction in Helsinki, Seattle and Toronto before returning to the next auction at Copenhagen Fur. Customers leave the purchased pelts behind and they're packed into boxes in the large cold storage rooms at Copenhagen Fur until they're ready to be dispatched to wherever the customers want them.
and for 40, for 40 now for 40 and for 50, for 50 and 70 and for 50, for 150 now and for 60, for 60, for 60 and for 70, for 170 and for 80, for 80 now for 80 and for 90, for 90 now and 500, 500 having sent up, 520, 540 going for 540, that's all, 540 going for 540. I gamle dage, der betragtede man øh, dyrene sådan meget mekanisk. Øh, man mente, de gjorde det, de skulle gøre, og så er der ikke foregik ret meget mellem ørerne på dem. Men den opfattelse, den er forældet, og nu ved vi godt, at dyr, de kan skille mellem skidt og kanel, og derfor så har man også en forpligtelse til at sørge for, at dyrene har det godt. Dyr, der har en god velfærd, de er også gode produktionsdyr, i modsætning til dyr, der har en dårlig velfærd, som producerer dårligt. Så der er mange årsager til, at adfærd og velfærd er interessant. Forsker i mindst velfærd er ved at undersøge, hvordan dyrene de oplever øh, deres egen situation. Det er sådan, at hvis dyrene er begrænset, eller føler sig truet, eller ikke kan reagere hensigtsmæssigt, øh, så vil vi ofte se øh, stressreaktioner, både adfærdsmæssigt og fysiologisk. Principielt kan man ændre velfærden på flere måder. Øh, man kan dels prøve at ændre dyrene. Øh, det er det, man har gjort igennem mange år, hvor man hele tiden vælger de dyr ud, som er bedst egnet til det produktionssystem, man nu engang har. Det er også det, man kalder domesticering. Eller også så kan man prøve at kigge på det produktionssystem, man nu engang holder mængden i, og prøve at se, hvad er det for et system, de bedst trives i, ved at måle på deres velfærd og deres adfærdsreaktioner. Ja, det her system, vi ser, det er beregnet til at måle, hvor meget mængden prioriterer forskellige ressourcer. Og princippet det er sådan, at vi beder mængden om at lave et arbejde, som består i, at den skal trykke på en pedal her. Og så bestemmer vi, hvor mange gange den skal trykke, for at den kan få adgang til at løbe i løbehjul, som I kan se herover, eller den kan få adgang til vandet, for det, når den får adgang til det, så løfter vi vandet op omkring buret, og så har den et svømmebassin herinde. Alternativt, så kan den trykke på pedalen, og så få adgang til en redekasse herover. Den er lavet sådan, at den består af to kamre. Det første, det er den redekasse, den kan være inde i, og så bestemmer vi, hvor lang tid den har adgang til redekassen, så går bagvæggen frem, og døren går op her, og mængden ryger ud. Og så skal den over og trykke på pedalen en gang til, for at komme ind. At grunden til, at vi måler de her ting, det er, at vi kan prioritere og finde ud af, hvor meget dyrene prioriterer de forskellige ressourcer. Altså, hvor meget, vil den, hvor meget sætter den pris på adgang til en redekasse, hvor meget sætter den pris på at løbe i et løbehjul, og hvor meget sætter den pris på at komme øh, for adgang til et svømmevand. Og samtidig så kunne vi sammenligne det med, hvor meget prioriterer den for eksempel at få noget at spise. Vi kan på samme måde måle, at hvor mange gange skal arbejde for at få et givet antal gram med. Erhvervet har jo en interesse i både at sikre dyrene en god velfærd, men selvfølgelig også at sikre en sund økonomi i deres erhverv. Og det gør jo så, at de selvfølgelig skal vurdere, hvor store er de her velfærdsforbedringer i forhold til de økonomiske udgifter, der er på det, specielt når vi er på det her niveau, hvor vi er, hvor mængden jo stort set har det godt. Nogle af de der anbefalinger og konklusioner, vi har draget her på Forskningscenteret, er ligesom blevet implementeret i lovgivningen. Det gælder dels, at man skal prøve at gøre dyrene mindre frygtsomme. Det er en proces, som har været i gang lang tid, men man, vi har ligesom vist metoden, hvordan man kan intensivere den der selektion. Der er også kommet den tilføjelse, at man skal berige burene, enten med, hvor de skal have permanent adgang til halen, eller at de skal have adgang til en hylde eller et rør. Og det er helt sikkert nogle af de ting, som har en øh, god effekt på dyrens velfærd. Ja, man må sige, at danske mink har det godt. Man kan så altid diskutere, om god velfærd kan blive bedre. Men generelt må man sige, at den har det godt. Skal I se, nu går vi over i den her hal. Nå. Øh, hvor mange øh, mink har du? Der er 15.000 her på farmen, siger computeren. 
Jamen, jeg synes da, at det er nødvendigt, at alle grene inden for landbruget har en vis pligt til at oplyse befolkningen om, hvad det er, vi egentlig går og laver. Det var vi i mange år ikke særlig gode til. Alle snakkede med naboen ud over minkhegnet, men det var faktisk mig, der fik ideen en gang og sagde, hvorfor åbner vi ikke vores farm og tager de mennesker ind og viser dem, hvad det er, vi laver og hvad der foregår på den anden side af hegnet. Hvordan kan man kende forskel på sådan en pande og sådan en det der tæve? En tæve? Du kan se, at tæven den er den lille, og handen det er den store. Okay. I kan se derude for enden. Kan I se de små ventiler derude? Ja. Minken trykker på, med næsen på den der ventil, ja. og der er vand, så de kan drikke frisk vand hele døgnet rundt. Jeg vil sige, at 99 procent af dem, der kommer, de har et utroligt positivt syn, når de først har været inde på den anden side af hegnet og se, hvad det er, vi laver. Jamen, stemningen omkring pelsdyr i dag, den er jo rigtig god, vil jeg sige. Øhm, ikke bare med, at vi kan bryste os af, at vi har verdens største aktionshus, og øh, klimaet i Danmark er godt til at, at lave pelsdyr i, men øh, jeg tror, at de fleste har en positiv holdning til det. Når først du har haft lukket mænd, så tror jeg, at de fleste har en positiv holdning. Og nu er vi jo så heldige, kan vi sige lige for tiden, at pels er jo utrolig i modebilledet. Ikke kun blandt ældre, men også ganske blandt de helt unge. Hvorfor var det lige de der... Hvorfor, hvorfor vi har valgt mink? Ja, i stedet for heste eller køer. Jamen, det er fordi, at vi synes, at, at vi synes godt om minken. For det første er det et lille, et lille væverdyr, og mig som pige, jeg kan meget bedre håndtere en mink, end jeg vil kunne håndtere en gris eller en ko. Copenhagen Fur operates its creative design center, Copenhagen Studio, from a disused warehouse on Lange Linie in Copenhagen. At Copenhagen Studio, Copenhagen Fur's own farriers work closely with international designers to develop the fur designs of tomorrow. Creative minds meet and wrestle with new ideas. They experiment with coloring, combinations of materials, cutting techniques and completely new ways of using fur, for example as yarn for knitted jumpers. The list of international designers and fashion houses working with Copenhagen fur is long. Copenhagen fur has opened a similar studio in Beijing in China in collaboration with the best Chinese design faculty at Tsinghua University. Here Chinese design students learn how to work with fur. New fur processing techniques are also developed. Copenhagen Studio also works with design students and educational establishments and provides the framework for the Golden Fur Pin Design Competition, where young designers compete for this prestigious design award. Jeg hedder Christina Utson, og jeg er her i dag i min forretning i Aarhus, Vestergade, som min mor og far startede for 40 år siden. Vi er en familie, som er vokset op med pels igennem generationer, og derfor var det også naturligt for mig at gå ind og overtage butikken. Min egen far havde min far, og han var bundt med jer, og min bedstefar og min oldefar var bundt med alle sammen, og folk ved, at når de går herind hos os, og det har de altid vidst, så øh, er der ikke gået på kompromis med råvarer, og altid kun købt danske skin. Og grunden til, at vi har gjort det, det er selvfølgelig også, øh, fordi at vi er verdens bedste til at producere minkskin. Og så ville det da være fuldstændig tåbeligt at købe skinnene, f.eks. i Kina. Men det er jo ligesom alt muligt andet, det er et spørgsmål om tillid, når man køber en pels. For mange mennesker er det her en gang i livet. Jeg synes virkelig, at jeg ser en tendens til, at i dag er det faktisk yngre og yngre kvinder, der også Øh, køber pelsværk, og det er jo også kvæg, at designet er blevet anderledes. Men det sjove er faktisk, at jeg oplever også, at den ældre generation i dag også vil have noget, der er smart. Så man kan sige, at vi har alle sider i os, og det er det, som er kunsten, når man laver pelsværk til kvinder i dag. Det er at få alle de sider frem. Men det hele det starter ved 
den dygtige minkfarmer, som forstår og producerer de smukkeste skind i verden. Og det kan vi i Danmark.